Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be discussing mass shootings in America and the effects on survivors and communities after the tragedy is over and out of the headlines. My special guests today are Anita Bush, president of Victims First and co-founder of the National Compassion Fund, Scott Richmond, regional director of the New York, New Jersey for the Amity Defamation League, Andy Pelosi, executive director of the Campaign to Keep Guns Off Campus, and Eric Mace, the leadership counsel and advocate of the National Compassion Fund and Victims First. So thank you so much for joining us. We are so very grateful, and, and it, is, it is such an important discussion to have. We've had so many uh, different um, uh, shows on this. <clears throat> So I'd like to sort of set you up, uh, and I'm going to go to you, Anita. You know, we've we've seen it all, right? Buffalo, Uvalde, Tulsa, Philadelphia, and so many others. I mean, it's just it's just stunning. In 2022 alone, there have been over 245 mass shootings in America. More mass shootings in this country than days in the year so far. It wasn't always like this. And today, our focus is on what is needed for victims, their families, survivors, and what actions we can take to stop this carnage of death in America. So, Anita, let's start with you. The murder of your cousin in the Colorado theater shooting caused you to become an advocate, and you quickly identified an astonishing gap in our law. So could you talk about that gap in our law and talk about victims first, your work? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, Yes, after um, Michaela was murdered in the Aurora um, theater mass shooting, there was a nonprofit that started collecting funds using the names and faces of all of our loved ones that were murdered. And um, it was called the Aurora Victims Relief Fund. However, we were soon to find out um, when someone tried to get help um, burying their child that those funds were actually not meant for the victims. They were going to go to local area nonprofits we stood up and we voiced our objection to this and we fought to get the donations to uh, everyone that was um, uh, directly impacted by the shooting. We, we um, were only partially successful in that. Uh, Those who had been uh, present um, when the mass shooting happened, some people who had held others in their arms when they died, Um, they were not considered eligible for the funds. We knew there was a problem with this and we wanted to make sure that all people, all the entire victim base would be helped. Uh, We reached back to uh, families of the deceased of Columbine, Virginia Tech, all of us in Aurora, uh, NIU, Eric's um, family, uh, Oak Creek Sick Temple, and then finally Newtown. And we were able to go to the National Center for Victims of Crime in Washington, D.C., and ask them for a different model, one that would um, um, ensure that 100 uh, percent of public intent would be realized and 100 percent would go out directly in cash payments to the, the victims who, and the survivors who needed the help. There was, there's always a, a, a talk about long term needs. Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you do not give what is intended for victims, and this is in the millions of dollars um, for victims themselves. There is a sense of a feeling of revictimization and exploitation. When, and re-traumatization, right? The cycle never yes. ends, right? Because <laughs> yes. the story is told. And, and, and Scott, I mean, you've, you've experienced this uh, Eric, you've experienced this sort of re-victimization of, of an exploitation. Um, Scott, could you talk a little bit about your take, and then we're going to go to Eric and to Andy on this this issue that Anita raises of you know th- this impediment to healing that occurs through re-victimization, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Um, it is a real problem. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, from ADL's perspective, we're an organization that uh, is dedicated to fighting hate, uh, hate in all its forms. And uh, this is a particularly vicious form of uh, of hate. My experience was on the ground uh, in Buffalo, uh, since I'm the director for ADL's office covering New York and New Jersey. 
uh, you know, I can I can speak a little bit about uh, that experience and and what uh, uh, what I encountered and what ADL's role there was. Uh, I think that that might be illustrative of how one responds to these issues. Um, is that uh, that okay? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so you know, I think that um, you know our response was one of uh, sort of along a spectrum of being going from reactive to uh, to proactive. Uh, from the reactive standpoint, we were there uh, to show allyship to the victims. Uh, you know, this was an attack on the black community and recognizing, you know, who, who was being attacked here. We're a Jewish organization, but we fight all forms of hate uh, and making sure that that we're there in that allyship role is, is really the most immediate form. Were you of, careful, of were you careful that, that you didn't appropriate the, the story of the victims and, and to ensure that the attention was placed on the black communities that were attacked so that, directly? That's really yeah, exactly my point. You know, it's it's not our place. That, and to make sure that I said that this is an attack on the black community. I mean, you know, if we look at the shooter's manifesto, it's filled with anti-Semit anti-Semitism, a real anti-Semitic screed. But this was clearly an attack on the black community. Man had no love for Jews. He had no love for blacks. He had no love for many groups. But we needed to make sure that this community and the victims were were front and center. Um, but, you know, there was there was much more to be done here in terms of educating on issues like the great replacement theory, uh, which go beyond this. And, and what does that mean? A major role for ADL and going beyond that. And, and again, along the spectrum from reactive to proactive, it's about policy recommendations. Uh, you know, it, it, we need to use these as not just moments of learning, but moments of action. Uh, so we've made many policy recommendations over the years, which uh, which uh, we, we really incorporated into this response. So, Eric, for example, let, social me, let me just cut you off there. Yeah, that, uh, I'd, I'd like to go to Eric. How do we ensure how do I ensure that as as a citizen who wants to be supportive, that I am behaving in a way that you would embrace as a victim, that I am doing the right thing and thinking through being instructed by you, uh, Anita and others, so that my behaviors are supportive. Oh, okay. Um, from, from my perspective, one of the things that um, I think that I get down to, and it seems like a small thing, but I have a real problem with the language that props up that crops up around some of these shootings we refer to even in the the introduction to this um we refer to the people who were killed as having been lost um i can tell you right now i did not set my daughter down somewhere and forget where i left her i did not lose her it was nothing that i did she was taken from me um we have the tendency to refer to people who were killed in mass shootings as having passed away or having died. They were murdered. The, this is an ugly situation and by softening it, we've made it easier for society to accept it. And I think that that kind of thing perpetuates these. Um, to kind of bring this back, we end up a lot of us feeling like we've been abandoned and society kind of sets us up for that. We want to try to say things in ways that make people feel comfortable as opposed to uncomfortable when talking about uncomfortable things. They should always be uncomfortable. That should be ever present in our mind. Um, and so it, it may be a, a small issue in some people's eyes, but I think it's huge because it sets our mindset that at some level, these things are acceptable. I think that we should earnestly as a society always see them as being completely unacceptable. And I'm sorry if, um, about my own ignorance, and thank you so much for correcting it. I mean, the, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. We, we shy from the uncomfortable, and we need to look the uncomfortable straight in the eye and deal with it and understand our own complicity in allowing this society to, to, to function in this way. 
Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Eric. And, and Andy, would you like to comment on Eric's point um, and, and Anita's point about this idea of, of how uh, people who have experienced this need to um, be respected and, and helped and how we can all uh, do exactly that. Sure. Um, thank you, Mark, uh, for inviting me uh, on this panel. Uh, I I've been doing the work for just over 25 years. I I'm not a survivor. I don't know what it's like. Um, I'll never know what it's like, I hope. You know, to lose a love, to have a, lo a loved one taken from me. Um, but I've worked with a number of, of survivors over the years. And I think one of the things that if you're a, a gun control organization like, like ours is that you, when you're working with survivors and victims, that you need to be respectful. Uh, you have to uh, try to, you, you do not want to take advantage of their pain. And I do see that happening uh, from time to time. I, I, I'm hoping we've never done that. Um, but we, we, I'm very cognizant of that. Uh, my first organization that I worked for was a board that was almost fully comprised of people that had their children killed uh, in different types of shootings. And I, 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 that really kind of formed how I operated um, you know, moving forward. Uh, so the first thing is to really, uh, uh, for top of mind, to be thinking about uh, compassion uh, and not taking advantage. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things that we try to focus on. We're an advocacy organization. Uh, you know, we we are trying to um, promote safe educational spaces. That's pretty much our that's our lane, whether it be K through 12 or, or colleges. And um, when something happens, like uh, Uvalde or or Sandy Hook, for that matter, or another school shooting or you know a college shooting, we first are trying to be compassionate. Um, but we do switch our modes. We do switch into advocacy mode. Um, and, uh, you know, but all the time trying not to raise money, for example, on the backs of people that have been killed. Um, but there are certain realities too, that, you know, in order for us to do our work, we do need to have some type of, of money coming in. I mean, I just, you know, that, that's, that's a reality, but, but we try to balance that without taking advantage, uh, if you will. So, I, I so think we have, goes, we have a direct forward. action organization like yours. We yeah. have. Uh, Scott, in terms of, of an anti-hate organization like yours, and then we have people who have uh, who have had this this experience of having their their loved ones murdered. How do we together together figure out a way to bring everybody into this tent, have a discussion, and create action? And and I'm going to go to Eric. We're we're going to go back around the table now in the reverse order. Eric and then Scott, and then uh, Anita, and then we'll end up uh, with Andy. Um, what is the thing, what are the thing, the set of things that we all need to do? Because whether we're, we all have uh, imperfect uh, ways of expressing it, uh, we're, we're trying our best. How can we uh, do better, Eric? I think that, you know, that one of the things that we need to do um, to do better as a society is to start looking at, um, you know, from the perspective of how money is raised, pay attention to who we're actually giving money to. Um, we, we frequently see um, something that says, you know, fundraiser for somebody's tragedy. And we go in there and we contribute a bunch of money where there's a little uh, change jar by the register at the convenience store and you just drop your change in there you don't really know where that's going. And we often don't think about it um, since becoming- so Your point is that we should look at charitable contributions as an investment and we want to have impact for the investment. We want to have the desired impact for the investment. Right? Absolutely. I agree completely. The, you know, I've changed in the last 15 years how I go about giving money to charities. It's not, oh, that sounds like a good cause. I'll give them some money. It sounds like it's more along the lines of that sounds like a good cause. I think I'll look them up. Let's see what see they if, do. And see they if they're do. having. Right. So if, so if I want to give money to somebody who has been traumatized and help them heal or have a, has a physical injury that, that requires medical attention, I want to know that that's where the money is going to. If I want to go, if I want to 
give money to an anti-hate organization like uh, like yours, Scott. And I was in Pittsburgh when the shooting occurred at the synagogue there. I went. So, um, uh, Scott, um, talk about how how you deal with that that issue of ensuring that your investment is the is is effectively translated into actions. Uh, sure. So, look, I mean, uh, you know, from ADL's perspective, uh, we are um, we're out there, uh, you know, in a in a deep way, uh, being very visible with uh, with policy recommendations, with uh, with education programs. Uh, you know, it's 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 about being out there in the community, but it's about uh, engaging in advocacy. And just to your point before about um, how we uh, how we should be approaching this. I think part of the issue is that it ends up getting wrapped up uh, in some sort of partisan divide. Uh, and that is something that we need to avoid. Uh, you know, our system is built around compromise around the center. And too often we end up putting out sort of partisan uh, messages that feel right in the moment but are not going to help us because our system doesn't work when we when we don't compromise around the center. Political parties are, are beside the point when it comes to this issue. Andy, Scott, do you ever redirect donations that people want to give to you to another cause because you think that the donor has a different intent than you fund? Do you ever do that? Go ahead, Scott, if you want to take that first. Uh, look, you know, we we have many donations to ADL. And if somebody is coming to us with uh, with a donation for something either that we don't support or that we don't agree with, uh, you know, we, we would certainly have to think twice about accepting it. Andy, I mean, I would I, I haven't encountered that, uh, Mark, over the years uh, with the campaign, uh, that type of a situation. Uh, if it you know, if it did arise, obviously, we'd redirect. The one thing that we do do from time to time is is try to fundraise for, um, you know, if there is a shooting that has taken place in a, in a place is direct our members to help folks in that community. Uh, that is something that we do do, on, on a, you know, unfortunately now becoming a regular basis. And Anita, how do you, how do you partner with other organizations or do you partner with other organizations that are taking direct action that your, uh, your group would favor? Um, how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, or are you mostly, focused entirely on your constituents. We we look at, to, to Scott's point, I thought you made a very good point. I mean, we are nonpartisan because it doesn't matter if you're red or blue. Right. If you're suffering and you've been, and you need help, that we're here to, to help those families. Um, we, you know, we, we began the National Compassion Fund out of a need and then we began victims first out of a need. <clears throat> and if there are um, other organizations, we have partnered with other organizations that um, share a common goal, which is to make sure that the victims and survivors are helped first and foremost. And that's uh, been everything from um, the Christina Grimmy Foundation, which uh, supports um, <clears throat> and gives financial help to all victims of gun violence and BTV Care, which is Virginia Tech families who three plus years after a um, after a mass shooting, they're there to provide um, funds if they need need them, and that even goes to bereavement care. We've we've partnered with um, those who are fighting for paid uh, time off work uh, for families of of mass casualty crime. We've seen we've seen the need because um, I can tell you many stories where after their child is murdered, that the employer says to, the, uh, to their employee, parent, um, well, you have three days and that's it. You have to come back to work after three days. We encountered that in Aurora. We've encountered that in Vegas. We had a situation like that. So um, it happens a lot. So we do partner for, with other organizations that provide victim care. And uh, so we're taking uh, Anita's energy and let's go around the table. Um, Scott, Anita just mentioned a whole range of different 
programs that she has to take care of victims who are not being necessarily supported in appropriate ways. Uh, Scott, could you talk about uh, one or two of your programs that that fight against hate and that deal with the issues that are happening in your region of the country? Sure. So, look, uh, you know, we we've identified a lot of causes here, uh, certainly over the past few weeks. We've talked a lot about social media. We've talked a lot about extremism. Uh, this is not new for ADL. And I could point you to two particular plans. ADL's REPAIR plan. Uh, REPAIR is actually an acronym, R-E-P-A-I-R. Each one of those letters stands for uh, an aspect of how we recommend fighting against what's happening on social media, the hate on social media, reforming Section 230, which is the communications law which governs liability in social media. And the second is PROTECT. Which immunizes social media companies from any responsibility for what their sites carry. Exactly. It was created in 1996, and it's complete opposite of the way that media was dealt with before. Um, Protect plan, that's to fight against extremism. We introduced that in the wake of January 6th, in the wake of the insurrection. Uh, We brought that to the Homeland Security Committee of Congress just a few weeks after that. And aspects of the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act are uh, are uh, incorporated uh, parts of the PROTECT plan. So uh, you can just Google ADL Repair, ADL Protect, and you're going to see a robust set of recommendations to deal with these, these issues for our time. Andy, could you do the same? Could you talk about some of your programs? And by the way, um, uh, we, we had taken two polls. We're on, the, we're on a third, which will be quite interesting. The first poll was, um, have you modified your behavior? Um, based in in, uh, in knowledge of these attacks. And two-thirds said yes, one-third said no. Um, and then the, the second poll um, really had to do with whether people had actually contributed to, uh, to any kind of fund uh, about this. And one-third said yes, and two-thirds said no. That's, very in- that's a very interesting juxtaposition. The third is about reform, and I'll announce the results once once they're in. But Andy, could you talk a little bit about uh, some of your programs, and then we're going to go uh, to Eric. I mean, I, th- I think that you know it, it just bears repeating for for my organization. We're a gun violence prevention organization, uh, so our first focus is going to be on on the weapons. Uh, we acknowledge, so for instance, for uh, you know what Scott had said about social media. And, and, and hate and, and, and how these things are, are, are drivers, that's very important. Uh, that's outside you know, our expertise, focusing on the guns. Another thing that we also acknowledge uh, are resources, resources for schools. Uh, most schools are, are underfunded. They don't have social workers, counselors, things like that, that are, that are sorely needed. Uh, and that's a huge problem across the country. Uh, so those are things that we, we clearly acknowledge. But what we can focus on are our access to weapons. Um, we believe that uh, there's too easy access in this country to, uh, to firearms. And uh, we also don't want to see schools militarized. That's, a, that's another um, you know, point uh, that we're, we're very concerned about. So those are things that we focus on, uh, whether it be on the state level um, or on the federal level, primarily on the state level. That's where our work uh, takes place, you know, whether it's trying to secure college campuses or also trying to um, push back on arming of school personnel in, in K through 12 uh, uh, scenarios. But again, our main focus is the gun, uh, but we understand that that's only part of the problem here, uh, but that's what that's where our expertise lies. And Eric, you, you focus on, on advocacy for those who are victims. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your most important programs? Well, I think the the most important programs, and Anita can flesh this out much more than I can, um, but the importance of what we do is to establish a a temporary holding place for funds and then a mechanism for distributing them to the right people and then closing up and disappearing. We are not uh, oriented towards the idea of creating a foundation that exists forever and ever. We're there for the short-term need and to honor the donor intent to make sure that the money gets to the people that it needs to get to. So when we come in, we come in usually within 24 hours of a tragedy, set things up, start working with the various other fundraisers to try to channel their funds into a fund like ours, not necessarily ours, but one that has the same intent as ours. 
We close the fund usually within 90 to 100 days, have a, a, a steering series of steering committee meetings, and then a public meeting with the victim base to tell them what we've kind of come up with, let them have some input. Then we distribute the money, close down shop and disappear. We are done. Um, we're not here to try to build great buildings or create monumental memorials. What we're here to do is make sure that the victims are taken care of in that period of time when they really need it the most. That is that is so superb. Anita, I'm sorry, I didn't go ahead. I would just add to that <clears throat> in the immediate aftermath, we also um, contact um, government officials and those in, in the community and we let them know about best practices. And this was a document. Um, I was a journalist for many years, New York Times, LA Times, et cetera, I ran my own newspaper. And um, we, over many years, um, put together a document um, interviewing victims in various categories, families of the deceased, those wounded, AKA shot, those uh, catastrophically wounded as well, those injured and those who survived a mass shooting or mass casualty crime, what worked, what didn't, what re-victimized, what was helpful. We put that all in a document and then we shared with, we, we've shared it around the country and Congress people are sharing it. And you know many, many people are sharing it, many communities. And it actually helps them organize in the aftermath and um, gives them some kind of, excuse me, firsthand experience of what they need to do for instance, immediately after, many people do not know that there are multi-million dollar grants to be had from the federal government for mental health, uh, mental health grants for the community afterwards. So in addition to the fundraise, well, we collect, in addition to collecting the funds and making sure they actually get to the, the families who need them, we also educate behind the scenes. It's a, it's such important work. Um, I, I said that I would um, would uh, announce the results of our last poll. Very interesting. We asked, "What changes can we make to reduce gun deaths in America?" And we said, "Select as many as that applicable." And we had all the things that are that are familiar to all of you: uh, raise the gun, uh, the age for gun purchases, required standard training and licensing for all gun. Owners uh, require higher restrictions for weapons and ammunition of war, require standard and thorough background checks, improve mental health treatment in America, implement red flag laws, pardon targets, and so on and so forth. We had very much a, a unanimous uh, response that advocates all of these amongst the people who attend. Pardoning targets like schools, not so much. We also asked whether we should confiscate all guns. Not a single person um, reported in the affirmative. I mean, it, it seems that we have things that we can we can do, but we're not doing them. So that's part of the issue, isn't it? Is is we need to go and take that extra step, come together and do things that will reduce the problem. Perhaps not eliminating it, but not making the perfect the enemy of the good and reduce the impact. Um, let's go around the table and let's ask for a uh, final comment. I'm going to start with Andy, go to Scott, um, go to Eric, and then Anita, we're going to give you the final word. Um, Andy, Scott, um, what do you think about, about how we as a society ought to respond in terms of, of the actions that we can directly take? And then we're going to uh, close with Eric and, and Anita. I mean, I, I thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll just be brief. Um, the, we fully acknowledge that legislation is, is not the only it's not the only answer here. I think what we really need, we need strong gun laws in our view, uh, because strong gun laws do work. And, and we've seen that in a number of states like New York, Massachusetts, California, Connecticut, for just for starters. But we need to think of cultural change. That's more important. It's like, you know, how we are, you know, how we're treating each other, uh, you know, this whole rise in hate, white supremacy and, and other things. And. Uh, that that's extremely scary. Uh, the weapon is is, is become a, you know an instrument, but uh, but I think um, you know doing this for so long, there has to be cultural change. I think guns have to be viewed uh, in a different light, uh, and I'm not sure how we get there, but I think we need to start working on that in, in earnest. 
Okay. And so how, what, is your, what is your answer? I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I, I started off by saying that ADL looks at this from reactive to proactive, going from the allyship role all the way to the most proactive. Well, the most proactive we can be is a cultural change. You know, creating a society where people respect one another, where we celebrate difference, where we celebrate diversity rather than looking down on it. So ADL uh, engage in anti-bias programs and anti-bullying programs that touch millions of students across the country. That is the goal of those programs. Our No Place for Hate program, for example, we have in hundreds of schools in New York and New Jersey where I'm the director. And that's what they do. Teachers, administrators, parents and students come together to engage in activities and really model for people that, you know, hate is not is not right. We do not accept hate in our society and we are standing up against it. And those norms need to be in every school. And Eric, um, Anita, you know, anybody who uh, perpetrates these these acts are going to have mental health issues. But the acts are not just the result of mental health issues. We have no more of a challenge on mental health in the United States than we have anywhere else in the world. What, are, what should we be doing to prevent these, these issues from occurring? Um, one of the things I, I'll agree with, with Andy and Scott uh, 100% that there's a cultural shift that needs to go on. Um, I'll also mention that the, the market for let's go Brandon uh, flags and things that are sort of adolescent in their treatment of politics. I think those are a problem that we need to raise the, uh, the maturity level of the discourse from that kind of stuff. Um, I think that there's, there's several things that need to be done um, on the other side of it. But I, one of the things that I'm relatively um, connected to and very passionate about is the No Notoriety campaign that, the, that Tom Teaves and Karen Teaves started. Um, there's far and away too much uh, mentioning of the perpetrator and very little focus on the victims. Um, when we went through our shooting 14 years ago, it was entirely about the shooter everything that was publicized was about him. And we found out in the months after that, that he was in a lot of ways, a fan of the man who per perpetrated the shooting at Virginia Tech, that he and his friends would sit around and plot out, here's how the body count could have been higher. Um, by advertising that, putting it on TV through media, it seems like a movie, it doesn't seem real and it starts becoming almost a Dungeons and Dragons kind of game for people. We need to stop that. We need to stop promoting that. That should be unbelievably difficult to do. And you're saying that the media, the media, the media, all of us, anybody who is broadcasting in these kinds of venues, anybody on social media, anybody on conventional media, we all have a responsibility and it is, and we own the impact of what we do. I agree with that. Um, you know, the the thing that my view of it is, is that the person who perpetrated such an act should have their name mentioned once so that society knows who they are. And after that, they should become basically a chalk outline on the screen, you know, just a, a, a silhouette. They have no they have no name. They have no personality. They have no identity. They're just a perpetrator. Anita, what is what is your uh, answer to this? What what should we? Um, I would, I yeah. For the sake of public safety, no notoriety is important. There is a contagion effect, and um, I think whatever is in front of somebody in their in their field uh, that they see broken. Um, John F. Kennedy said something: one person um, can make a difference, and everyone should try. One of the things to quote Tom Teaves, uh, Tom and Karen began uh, no notoriety after their son Alex was killed protecting his girlfriend in the theater. Tom said something so kind of brilliant. He said, you know, after a mass casualty, there's all people rush to either side. There's a left and the right. People rush to either side. He said, we need a rush to the middle. We need everybody to rush to the middle 
sit down at the table and figure this out together. We need to listen to each other. We need to compromise, compromise, respect each other, maybe try something that is not necessarily our style, but because somebody else might believe in it, we try it. It cannot hurt us to try things that make us a little bit uncomfortable to see things that make us a little uncomfortable and to act on them. Thank you so much, all of you. It's Thank a you. very unusual discussion to have a discussion from these multiple perspectives, direct action groups, anti-hate anti groups, victims groups. Anita Bush, president of Victims First and co-founder of the National Compassion Front, Scott Richmond, regional director of the New York, New Jersey Anti-Defamation League, and Andy Pelosi, executive director of Campaign to Keep Guns Off Campus, Eric Mace, leadership counsel and advocate of the National Compassion Front and Victims First. Thank you so much for, again, I know this is your day, so I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate it and, and Everyone else here appreciates your helping us to navigate this and to inspiring us to further action. Uh, stay safe, uh, be blessed, and we very much appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.